Hi everyone, welcome to BIS 103 Lecture 12 and we are at the finish line. Today we finally will make ATP, so we'll continue our discussion on the electron transport chain, the ETC here, building on what we had learned about how we can use the ETC to transfer electrons, couple this to pushing protons across the mitochondrial membrane and use that energy eventually for ATP. And this is our purpose for today. We actually want to look at this enzyme here that is making ATP, the ATP synthase today. So our learning goal is that we want to be able to describe the function and catalytic mechanism of the ATP synthase. So this is our final step. So if you haven't yet watched the video of lecture 12 that looks at the energetics of the ETC and how we actually can use the energy to make ATP, as well as the lectures from um, number 11, where we look at the mechanism of the ETC, I encourage you to watch those first so you have an understanding of what's happening before we dive into actually making ATP in this video. So let's look at this machine, this enzymatic machine that makes ATP or ATP synthase. And when we do so, we really have to start with the man who identified it and who elucidated its mechanism not alone, of course, with other people, but he was a major driver, Paul Boyer. And he said throughout his work on the ATP synthase that all enzymes are beautiful, but ATP synthase is one of the most beautiful as well as one of the most unusual and important. And I hope at the end of this video you will agree with me that I think he's right. ATP synthase really is one of the best examples of nature's ingenuity on how we can use intricate biochemical mechanisms to sustain life. It's really a fantastic enzyme, a fantastic mechanism. So I want to spend some time on it. For his work, well-deserved, I think, he and his colleague John Walker um, received the Nobel Prize for elucidating the function of the ATP synthase in 1997. So let's look at this enzyme. So sort of highlighted here um, on the right side, the actual three-dimensional structure of our ATP synthase on the left side here in a little bit more of a um, cartoon style structure. I don't expect you to entirely understand all of the elements, um, but a certain subgroups we should understand. We have two major subdomains that are called F0 and F1. And they're made out of different subdomains and they're located at different positions. Okay. So if you're actually going to the left side here, your F0 domain here is embedded in the mitochondrial inner membrane, and one part of it is actually facing here to the inner membrane space. That, right, is where we have our proton gradient. That's where we're generating our proton motive force. Keep that in mind. And then from this F0 domain, we have this gamma domain or the shaft that is connecting this F0 domain to a number of alpha and beta subunits that make up part of the F1 domain. And so these are now facing into the matrix and these are actually the site of ATP synthesis. There are a number of additional domains here that have to do with the function of this enzyme as well as its, its structure. I don't ask you to focus on these. So we mostly will be looking at this domain here, the shaft, the gamma domain, and then these alpha and beta domains. Okay. It's sitting now in the inner membrane right, and facing with the F0 domain toward the proton gradient and with the F1 domain toward the matrix makes a lot of sense because it's right next to the ETC, right? We had said that all the complexes of the ETC are also integrated or at least attached to and bound to the inner membrane of the mitochondria in eukaryotic systems. So in addition to its fairly complex structure, what is really unique about the ATP synthase and distinguishes it from all the enzymes we have looked at so far is that it has a different mechanism. All the enzymes we looked at so far catalyze, right, oxidations, reductions, carbon-carbon cleavages, group transfers, so moving metabolites around, changing metabolites by breaking bonds and reattaching them. The ATP synthase does that too by phosphorylating ADP to ATP but the way it does it is really unique. It's actually a molecular motor. It uses rotation to do its job. And that's what really makes it so fascinating. So this F0 domain here actually is a rotator that is rotating and is moving this shaft and doing so it's actually moving our alpha and beta domains. And this movement is 
what allows us to make ATP from ADP and phosphate. Okay. So it's a molecular minute motor. Okay. So it being a motor and a rotator, we want to understand how the rotation actually works. Right? So let's look first at the rotation, then we'll look at what direction this actually takes, and at the end we will actually look at how this rotation is linked to ATP synthesis. So the way Paul Boyer and others have figured out that this is actually a molecular motor is that they isolated the ATP synthase and bound it on a chip essentially. And they did so using histidine. This is a very common molecular biology tool to use histidines to bind enzymes to a matrix. And he did so by putting it on its head. Right? So he's using this F1 domain here, the alpha beta domains. They are now bound to this matrix here. Here again, you have your gamma domain, the shaft, and now here we have our F0 domain, the rotor. And what they then did is that they attached something that they couldn't visualize. And in this case, they used an actin filament that you can visualize in a microscope. And to get it to the ATP synthesis, to get it bound, they used biotin and they used avidin. Those should sound familiar, to the very least biotin, right? Biotin was a cofactor that we're using for transferring carbon dioxide groups. So look at our video on how biotin works. But in addition to its physiological functions, biotin actually also is used a lot in, in molecular biology because it binds so well to proteins, in particular to a protein called avidin. Okay. And so using this, you can attach biotin to a recombinant protein. So if you have isolated the protein, it's called biotinylation. It's a common practice. And now you can attach your actin filament here to a molecule of avidin. That's a protein that binds very strongly to biotin. And now you have this constellation of your isolated protein with this actin filament that you can visualize. This part now is bound on the matrix, but the rotor can still function. Okay. So they did this. And so what they ended up seeing then here is actually captured in this video. See if I can activate this, here we go. So you can actually now see here the filament rotating, okay? That's exactly the experimental setup. It's down here just in images, but this was used to actually prove that this enzyme in fact is rotating and it's using this for ATP synthesis. So really fantastic, very smart experiment. And now we can use actually our protons and the flow of protons to do this, right? If you've seen the last video already, right, we had used the transfer of electrons in ETC to pump protons from the matrix into the inner membrane space, and then had calculated the energetics of these protons flowing back spontaneously with a gradient into the matrix can be used for ATP synthesis, right? And we had calculated the energetics. We had seen, yes, this can work. We're releasing enough energy from the electron transfer chain to pump protons across the membrane using our ETC complexes. And so these protons now can flow back spontaneously across the membrane. And this spontaneous flow back is releasing the exact same level of energy that we had put into it to pump them across. And we had said this is linked to ATP synthesis, but now we can actually see how it works. So if I activate this video here, this actually shows you again our, your F0 unit here, right here. This is your rotor. And the way it works is that actually the flow of protons is used to drive this rotation, right? So here we have in green animated here, these protons coming in from the inner membrane space. They're attached to the rotor and they're released again on the other side of the rotor, and so this transfer of the protons flowing through the rotor is actually driving the movement. Okay. So we're using the energy that is released in the spontaneous flow of the protons back along the gradient into the matrix to drive this rotation. Okay. And so then this rotation of the rotor F0 unit will also move this shaft. So now that we understand why the flow of protons is critical here to drive this rotor. We can start looking on into the mechanism, and I will only ask you to really understand the 
foundational part of this, not all of its details, and we can understand the direction. All right. So the way this works is right now we essentially have your F0 unit again here. Let me go back to the laser pointer so it's easier for you to see. Right here, here's our shaft again. And so this is the rotator that is moving. Right? And so on the right here, you only have now this, the rotor here, and you have this alpha domain too. Okay. Now the alpha domain is actually where the protons will flow through. So if we start down here, we now have a proton coming in here from the inner membrane space. It's flowing spontaneously along the gradient across the membrane. It enters this alpha domain and it will actually attach to an arginine that's a conserved in this domain here. And this protonation event, what it will do, it will allow the side chain of this amino acid to flop over. So it will actually make it move. And what it will do is it will actually change the interaction of this arginine with these individual subunits here of the rotor. So you can see the subunits a little bit better here in orange and yellow. So these are these alpha helices that are sort of indicated here. And so through this protonation, in every event of a protonation will move this arginine arm, will make it move along these subunits here. And that then up here, right, we have illustrated here, the arginine side chain is moving over. And in this process, we're actually releasing a proton on the other side of the alpha domain, and we're moving the rotor one over. And this will happen over and over again. Every proton event will allow the arginine to basically move one of these subunits of the rotor one over. I realize this is rather complex. If you understand this basic principle, that is perfectly fine. Okay. And I will not put this on the exam. I think it's really important to see and understand but we'll not ask questions on this, on mechanism of rotation on the exam. Here's just illustrated slightly differently. I think it, it might be a bit easier to see now. We're starting here on the left side, right? Here's your arginine, here's your intermembrane space and your proton gradient. Now a proton can come in here. It will displace the arginine. So that's what you're seeing here. The proton is coming in, it will, force the arginine to actually let go of an aspartate residue, right? That's just here. It will let go of it and will grab another one. And so these individual ones, these are the individual, they're called C subunits of this rotor. So it was attached to one here, it'll let go. And then the arginine here grabs another one. And the moment this arginine contacts and binds to this aspartate, now on the next subunit over, this aspartate will release a proton. Okay. So that's indicated right here. And so this will happen again, right? Another proton will come in, the arginine will flop back and so forth. Right? So in a way you can imagine it as, as a carousel here. Right? So you're sort of pushing your carousel along, right? Sort of always one more, one more. So you're, you're, you're basically grabbing one of these subunits after the other using this process and you can then generate this rotation of the subunit. Okay. And this is actually crazy fast, right? This is actually, this rotor of the ATP synthase runs at about 6,000 RPM or about 100 rotations per second. Right? It's an amazingly fast enzyme that it's doing here. So if you think about your car doing 6,000 RPM, most of our cars will simply burn out at this time. Right? So it's actually, it's, it's a Ferrari among the enzymes, really fascinating mechanism here. All right, so now we understand it rotates. We have some idea on how the directionality works by these arginines and aspartates driving through their um, proton-driven interactions it in one direction. But the really important part now is right, that we want to link the rotation to making ATP. To do so, we now have to look on the other side of the, of the enzyme. We actually have to look at the F1 domain right here and specifically at these better subunits shown in purple. Okay. So this is just the top view of the enzyme now and you have these beta domains here in different shades of purple. This is actually where the catalytic sites for ATP production are. And I, I say plural here, they're sites, because 
each of these beta domains has a catalytic site to bring about the production of ATP from ADP and phosphate. They just in this domain occur in different forms. So this one here in the light purple is empty. Then the active site, the, the catalytic site can actually open a little bit in a different conformation and can bind ADP and phosphate. And then there's a third conformation of this domain that now has the final ATP product here. And so each of these domains in one rotation of the enzyme will go through all three stages of empty, substrate binding and release of the product. So it's really fascinating. And this is brought about by changes in the conformation of these different subunits. So here's another video that sort of illustrates how this works. And it has to do with the fact that the shaft, so the gamma subdomain here highlighted in blue and gray is asymmetric. So what it does actually is because it's asymmetric and it's rotating because it's driven to rotate by our rotor, it actually pushes these beta domains here. And so with every rotation that it does, right, you can see here in red, green, and yellow, it is changing the conformation of these beta subunits. And so as this shaft is pushing into the subdomain, it changes the conformation of the active site, which means it's actually opening and closing them. It also means, right, if the shaft is pushing into one domain, opening it, the other one is not being pushed into its closing. So at any given time, you only have one of the three subunits that is open, one that binds the substrate, and one that has the final product in it. And that's why per rotation, every subunit goes through all three stages. So now we can see it here again. I've highlighted it for you. So we have right, the empty one here. This is actually called the open conformation of the beta subunits. It's inactive and it has, because of its conformation and the way the shaft pushes into it, a very low affinity to bind its substrate. As the shaft is moving now to the next one here, to the L configuration of the subunit, this is a ligand or loose conformation. Now it's increasing its affinity to the substrate. It's opening up. It can bind the substrate. And then the third one here is our T or tight conformation where we now have catalysis actually occurring and we're producing ATP. Here it's just shown again, maybe to make it a bit easier in a cartoon, these are your three subunits here, the beta subunits in yellow, red, and orange, depending on their current state. So we have in yellow, the open one. Then in orange, we have the loose one binding the substrates and then catalysis happening in the tight one. Okay. And then you see here in the middle here, your rotations happening. So the first part of the rotation will now move by right, this open one here over now we can substrate bind. The one that was loose now is tight. And the one that was tight and had catalysis now is empty and open. And now we have another rotation here and they're moving over. So each of the subunits can make one ATP per rotation. Okay, So one full rotation, three ATPs, because each of the subunits can make one ATP per full rotation of the F0 units. And that is conserved completely across all known ATP synthases. What is really curious though is that the number of protons per rotation is actually not conserved. For some reason we actually find that the rotor of the F0 subunit and this has different numbers of these C subunits. So the units that the arginine and aspartates are connecting to each other. And the known ATP synthases so far have 8 to 15 of the C subunits. And you can easily imagine that this might be rather important, right? Because the bigger the wheel gets, this will impact how much ATP you make, right? Because you need more protons to drive one rotation, okay? And so for us in humans, this is conserved at eight. We have eight subunits. Yeast and E. coli have two more, they have 10. And at least to my knowledge, the world leader right now is spirulina, that's a cyanobacterium. You might actually see this sometimes um, for example, at the co-op as a supplement that has 15 of these subunits. 
I don't think it's not quite clear yet why this actually is, why this variation is, but it does have an impact on how much protons you need to drive ATP synthesis. So this is just a last video here that I want to show you. This um, I also obviously all the videos I will upload um, later, but this really just shows you the full mechanism that we just discussed on how the ATP synthase works. So I'll let you watch this at your own leisure. We won't go through all of it, but it recaps in a nice illustration how the rotation actually drives conformational changes, drives ATP synthesis. So congratulations, awesome job. It took us 12 lectures, but we finally made ATP.